Well, good morning, and uh, may I greet you in the name of the our Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And uh, it's a pleasure to join together and worship together. Peace be unto you. And it's a special welcome to those uh, who are coming here for the first time. I know Carol from Mumbai is here for the first time. And our brother uh, with YVAM is also joining us. Thank you. And so may I see a few others, but thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Well, today is the sixth Sunday, as we say, from Resurrection Day or Easter. Some people don't like the word Easter, but, uh, but we know what we mean. And uh, uh, here in, in, in our fellowship in GCI, we follow what we call is a worship calendar. And if I can request uh, uh, our team to put up that picture on the screen. Uh, is it possible? No, you can't make it bigger, is it? Uh, it's a little, yeah, there you are. So the worship calendar looks like this. The first half of the worship calendar it actually begins with the coming of our Lord, the Advent season, uh, Christmas, the incarnation, Jesus is born. And so it focuses, the first half focuses on Christ, his ministry, what he accomplished for us. Uh, it moves on from there to, uh, you know, the uh, epiphany, uh, and then, of course, the Easter season. Um, from there, the second half uh, is what we have come to call ordinary time, focuses uh, on living what was learned during the first half. Not that we don't do it in the first half also, but that's the kind of a circle. But right in the middle, it's all Christ-centered. It's Jesus Christ our Lord. It is focused on Him entirely. He is the reason why we have a worship calendar. He is the reason why we come together. He is the reason indeed for our faith, our belief. Even as Paul said, if Christ isn't raised, then of course He was just another human being and our faith is fake, all false. But we know it isn't. We know He has been raised. Yes, thank you for that picture there. I thought I'll just uh, uh, acquaint you with how we um, sort of, uh, you know, view our worship. Uh, and right through the year, we are focused on Jesus, bringing the various aspects, helping us to understand how we then live and lead our lives. Well, in two Sundays, we will be coming up to what is called the Pentecost Sunday. And... Uh, after that, we will be moving into that so-called ordinary time. Not that it is very ordinary, but it is, you know, everything with God is extraordinary. And so, um, uh, so we continue to focus on our, you know, living and the way we want to dedicate our lives to Jesus. Well, still, we are still in, you know, what we call is Easter time. And so we want to focus on one interesting event uh, that is recorded for us in the Bible, which was read to us uh, today in the scripture reading. And the event is the appearance of Jesus, especially to Thomas. Of course, he appeared before to you know, Mary Magdalene and the other ladies, and then of course to the disciples. But here was a special appearance of Jesus uh, to Thomas. And so doubting Thomas, as we call him, becomes believing Thomas, right? If you can put it that way. And interestingly enough, a vast majority of Christians today who have ever lived have not physically seen Jesus like Thomas did and like all the other disciples did, and yet have come to believe, including all of us here and all our Christians today on the earth, we're not visually physically seen Jesus but then we have come to believe and uh, uh, I want to make some comments today about belief the very aspect and concept and reality of belief and what I think has come uh, or you know 
uh, with what Jesus said, believing without seeing. And you know that is what uh, Jesus said as we have read in the scripture. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alright. So let me first make some clarifications. And one is, you know, when we talk about doubting Thomas, we could tend, we tend to think that all the other disciples were much better than Thomas because they believed, right? We would, we, we would tend to conclude that, uh, um, that the others didn't need to touch Jesus, you know, uh, to believe. And that is not really true. Even the others had a hard time believing that Jesus uh, had been resurrected. It took an appearance even to them, you know, to come to believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, all of them were doubting disciples. And so why only focus on doubting Thomas, right? Uh, all the disciples were doubting until there was that special revelation to them visually so that they could all believe. So let's uh, be a little kind on Thomas uh, because uh, we are not, uh, you know, Thomas was not really uh, the only one who struggled to believe, you know, without seeing. Secondly, we might tend to think that Jesus was kind of berating Thomas, you know, kind of scolding him. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, putting him down by saying, hey, uh, you know, I mean, uh, come, you know, touch me. And then he says, blessed are those who believe even without seeing. And we might tend to think that Jesus was being a little harsh on him. But again, that is probably a misnomer. We do know that Thomas wanted, as we would call today, empirical evidence, right? <laughs> to use a technical word. Uh, empirical basically means information that is acquired by observation or experimentation. And uh, is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything wrong to be sure of what you come to understand and want to believe, right? There is nothing wrong in that. Uh, now, Thomas had a problem there and he needed that so-called empirical evidence and Jesus was willing to provide it. Jesus was willing to make a special appearance you know, in his life and provide that evidence. And so <clears throat> what we can, wh what we need to understand here is that uh, it is good for us to have evidence in what we believe in. Doesn't the, uh, uh, the, the apostle tell us, the apostle Paul, I think it was in, in 1 Thessalonians, he said, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things. In other words, God encourages evidence. He encourages us not to be you know, too fast to believe everything that comes along our way. Perhaps I should say it, you know, in this manner. Christianity should appeal to our reason. Certainly it must appeal to our heart, but it should also appeal to our reason, our intellect, right? Uh, and we are definitely encouraged not to have blind belief unreasoning faith. So Christianity is a reasonable faith. We can have the evidence of the historicity of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and of course we have so much of, you know, uh, material on that. So it is necessary for us to say here that Jesus is not necessarily encouraging us to believe without evidence when he says blessed are those who you know believe even without seeing but on the other hand the flip side 
let's note something important about evidence. Could it be a warning, even as Jesus reiterates the blessedness of belief without seeing, could it be also a warning to all those who are disposed to demand an excessive amount of evidence before they believe? Is it possible that sometimes we can become unreasonable in the way we want evidence before we want to uh, believe? You know, because some can put so much weight on their own faculties of wanting to know, wanting proof, proof upon proof, um, for evidence to believe. What is the problem when we are you know, not, you know, when the evidence is basically and fairly clear, but we want more and more and more evidence to believe, what is the problem there? The problem there is a sense, a, 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 I can put it this way, a sense of selfishness or, you know, self-centeredness. In other words, they only trust themselves and not the external evidence that's being provided to them. They will not believe anything or anybody and they want to have their own proof to believe. Right? And they have, they put themselves in the very center above all. And that's where the problem is. And sometimes they want evidence even putting God out of the picture. They want to satisfy themselves in such a manner where even God, when God says it, they are not prepared to believe. Right? Um, in, if you remember in John chapter 12, uh, here it is recorded, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. That's what the, the Gospels record. That Jesus, everything was so evident about him. And yet, some of the religious teachers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and on all the, the temple priests, they were not willing to give him, you know, that, uh, that privilege to finally acknowledge he was the Messiah. Even after seeing signs after signs and after signs. And here is the problem. How much evidence is necessary for us to believe? And if all of the evidence that is presented and yet people will find it difficult to believe, could it be a symptom? Could it be a sign of unbelief? That I don't want to believe. And that is a dangerous place to be in. Yeah. This kind of unbelief right, is not an informational problem. It is not an intellectual problem. It is not that you don't have enough evidence. It is a moral problem. There is something morally wrong when a person does not want to believe even after all of the evidence is provided they remain in unbelief and that is more or less saying I don't want to believe. You, I'm not sure if you, you have heard of an American philosopher, his name is Thomas Nagel. Uh, Thomas Nagel is, a, uh, is an atheist, he's a philosopher and he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. He makes a very interesting statement uh, in the light of what we have just discussed. And I just want to read a quote from him uh, in his book, which is titled The Last Word. He says, it isn't just that I don't believe in God. He goes on to say, naturally, I hope that I am right in my belief, <laughs> belief of not believing. It's that, and here is the point that he's making, it's that I hope there is no God. Right? I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. That is a very naked, powerful admission of his unbelief. 
basically what he's saying is i don't want to believe and like i said those who have this kind of a problem where they will not they will remain in unbelief will face many problems in life right because they will not want to believe anybody they will always struggle with the sense of belief which means they cannot trust anybody they live a life without trust they will not give their trust to anyone right because belief and trust goes together you see some find it so hard to trust others but what we have to realize is you cannot live your life without trust you cannot live your life without trust we have to learn to trust now i'm not saying that we have to trust without any evidence but when the evidence is provided and you still remain in unbelief well that's that's a horrible way to live because why i want to go on to say you know god has very clearly said to us that um, he wants us to live with a sense of community right uh, uh, aren't we uh, aren't we uh, haven't we read in the new testament where we are told that we have to live loving god loving our neighbor right i mean that is what even jesus uh, reiterated loving god loving others loving human kind but when there is this unbelief that is constantly you know uh, 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 troubling somebody they will find it hard to trust and enjoy a sense of community right when there is no trust you are unable to love because you will not trust in giving your love to anybody when there is unbelief you cannot make friends because you will not trust anybody because you feel that oh that person might uh, harm me right when there is no belief you will be suspicious of everybody you will live with a, a life of suspicion and that's not a very healthy way to live you know right what happens when you continue to persist in unbelief it leads to isolation it leads to loneliness and isolation and loneliness leads to emotional problems very difficult to find intimacy very difficult to experience intimacy in relationships you will fear to commit yourselves and this is one problem many young people go through today they are finding it difficult to commit themselves in a relationship because they can't trust now i'm not saying you should trust blindly <laughs> but on the other hand if you can just never trust it is not a very nice way to live because you will struggle and you will find a sense of loneliness which will lead to you know emotional disturbances and isolation but let's get back to the story i've gone off into a philosophical discussion <laughs> but let's get back to the story we were talking about doubting let's not say thomas anymore doubting disciples right um let's catch the story in john 20 verse 29 then jesus told them because you have seen me you have believed talking to thomas here <laughs> blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed now right away you might say oh there are two types of people one who believe by seeing one who believe by not seeing and what happens when you have this duality this uh, two tuness which is better than the other right which is superior than the other so we might tend to think oh you know i am superior because i haven't seen and yet believe so we tend to think that those who have a problem you know i mean uh, have seen and believe are kind of inferior now that is uh, once again a wrong conclusion to make what as much as i understand and i'm sure there are more ways to look at this particular saying of jesus what is jesus saying here? what is he intending to say what he's intending to say is jesus is promising that 
He is with us, those who believe without seeing, as much as He is with us, those who have seen and believed. In other words, we can experience the same closeness with Jesus, even if you have seen or not seen, but yet have believed. You can experience the same power of Jesus that the disciples experienced. Because they saw and believed. And we might think, oh, they are more superior or, 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 or inferior, whatever. But they had more power. But we can experience that same power that they had. Right? We can um, experience the same worship that Thomas did. As he sunk down on his knees and he said, my Lord and my God. That same worship, that same experience of worship, we can experience, even though we have not seen Jesus. Right? In other words, it's Jesus is encouraging. When he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, he's encouraging us that even though you have not seen, I am with you. I, am, I, will, I will have the same presence with you as I've had with the disciples. Right? We can claim that blessing that Jesus is pronouncing upon us. Now, let's come to the question, why is it blessed to believe in Jesus? Seen or not seen? I hope right, I've been able to establish the fact that we don't have to distinguish between the two. Jesus is pronouncing a blessing. You are blessed whether you're seen or not seen. But... What is this blessing? Why is it blessed to believe in Jesus, seen or not seen? And the crucial scripture there is verse 30. Let me read it for you. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in the book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And here is the crucial point. And that by believing you may have life in his name that we may have life in his name we have life because we believe nothing else can give us life brothers and sisters nothing else can give us life except we unite ourselves in our belief in Jesus because life is in him and him only it is for him to give us life. It's our belief in him that will impart for us and give us the right to have life. And our belief is special. Those of us who have put our faith in Christ our Lord. Our belief is special because it's a belief in a person. It's not just belief in a philosophy or a set of rules or a set of principles or a formula or an ideology. It's belief in a person. And the person of Jesus Christ is what we are talking of. And the uniqueness of Christianity is this. Believing a person. Not just what he teaches or what a philosophy he spreads. Belief in a person. Because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. Right? Um, that's why Christianity is not just a way of life. We, you know, many times you have heard Christianity is a way of life. It's not just a way of life. It is a, you, being united with a person and the person of Jesus. And, when, and the uniting of Jesus, when our un, unity in Jesus brings us in unity with the Father and the Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So when we... When we put our trust and our belief in Jesus, those seen or unseen, we will have the power to carry on. We will have the power and we will be given the power to retain our faith even in difficulty, even in trial, even in discouragement, even in doubts. Don't think that we have, we don't doubt. Many of us doubt and wonder, where are you God? Even the prophet David doubted. All you have to do is read the Psalms. 
And so, here is the important thing. When Jesus said that you will have life in his name, we will have life today. Be able to retain our faith and live a life for Jesus when we believe in him. Even in the most difficult of circumstances, believing in Jesus will give us that special strength to face the struggles, the problems, so that you may not give up, that you may continue to walk the walk until the very end, whatever that end might be. And like the apostle said, the apostle Paul said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That's the strength you and I will have a blessing of. We will be blessed with that strength because of our belief in Jesus. And that's the name of a lady in living in Australia. That's all we have from the story that I read. And living in Australia was born with a severe disability. Once again, the disability is not described. But she had a major problem with life because she constantly was so discouraged because of her disability, she just found it hard to carry on with life. And she writes in this story that I read, I wondered, she says, why I was still alive. She became suicidal. Because she goes on to say, the burden of my disability was so great. But my parents, she says, who lived the word of life, always gave me the same answer. And God loves you immensely and has a special plan for you. Those parents helped her to nurture that belief in Jesus Christ. Her parents gave her Christ and encouraged her to believe in him. And then she will be able, she will be given the strength to live in spite of her disability. She took up that challenge. She continued to believe in Jesus. And interestingly enough, she writes, you know, uh, in this story, uh, my night has no darkness. Very profound statement. My night has no darkness. She goes on to say, this has been my daily experience. Every time I chose to love and, and serve those around me, there is no more darkness. And I can experience the love that God has for me. She's able to live her life in spite of her disability because of the trust and belief that she reposed in Jesus Christ, her Lord. And in that trust, in that belief, she decided to love others, even as God loved her. She believed God loved her in spite of the fact that she was a mangled human being. She was able to give that love. And so, in spite of the fact that she was living a night, it was as though a night, but in that night, there was no darkness for her. Even though she could not see and experience healing or whatever, she chose to believe and because of that for her there was no darkness in spite of the fact that she was living a night the night was long blessed are those who believe though they have not seen and so brethren when life is hard when life is difficult when you feel the night is long, you are unable to see and experience physically the healing or whatever of Jesus Christ. We are encouraged to believe. Believe, believe that he is alive. 
believe that he will strengthen you and he will see you through those difficulties even though those circumstances may not necessarily be taken away our belief in Jesus will see us through and like Thomas let us all fall down and worship him even though we have not seen him blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed I'd like to lead you into the communion at this time and uh, today the host and the wine the bread and wine has been prepared by us by the Sandry family and I request them to bring it forward as we prepare ourselves to partake in the table of the Lord the communion As uh, the bread and wine is being prepared for us, uh, let me lead you into your preparation for taking of the communion. We are given a story in the book of Acts about the Apostle Paul, Paul and Silas, if you remember, these two godly ones who were preaching the gospel but they were they were arraigned and they were imprisoned they were beaten and you remember if you remember the story in Acts chapter 16 suddenly there while they were in prison there was a huge earthquake and suddenly the chains that they were tied up with were removed were suddenly dropped and the doors were open the jailer who was looking after them was so afraid that they will escape but they pacified him they encouraged him to not be worried about that and obviously the jailer believed this was a miracle because Paul and Silas were singing hymns while they were in chains and suddenly this miracle appeared and interesting what the jailer says sirs what must I do to be saved his belief he suddenly immediately believed and they replied believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household and Jesus Christ attending a festival as is recorded in John chapter 7 on the last day on the last and great day of the festival Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice with tremendous passion in his voice even like our girls were singing with so much of passion which is such a wonderful thing to see you can imagine how Jesus with a loud voice with all his being said the following let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink whoever believes in me believes in me as the scripture has said rivers of living waters will flow from within them and so brethren Jesus invites you and me to believe in him because he has declared he is the way the truth and the life in him we have life and life to the full so let us pray at this time for the elements prepared for us and then we will come forward take the elements if you can go back to your seats and then we will all partake of it together let's pray gracious loving father at this moment we bring a special blessing upon the Sandry family for lovingly having prepared this uh, bread and wine for us to participate and we know what a special occasion it is when we are able to come to the table Lord that you have prepared and today through the Sandry family we thank you father for this we thank you that you are inviting us to believe in you because you so passionately want us to 
quench our thirst, our spiritual thirst, our eternal thirst. You will give us rivers of living waters that will quench us, not only quench us, but it will, it will flow out from us. And so, gracious Lord, bless this wine and this bread as a symbol of your body broken for us, your blood, your blood shed on the cross for us. And may we believe as we take it that we have life in your name. And indeed, you will raise us up at that last day. We thank you, Lord, for your mercies. We thank you for inviting us. We thank you for giving us the ability to believe because you are indeed the Alpha and Omega, the beginner and the perfecter of our faith. And in his name we pray. Amen. Please come forward, take uh, your elements, go back to your seat and then we will partake together.